Hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel. I'm a French, but London-based, data protection partner at Bird & Bird. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Katja, from our Danish office. Hi, Katja. Hello. For Hi. a podcast looking at the GDPR. And we want to do here a sort of a backward and forward looking session. First, by looking at what has been the trends for the past three years of GDPR operation. And second, what do we see in the horizon? What do we see in the future? And what could be the, the takeaways? We're going to do this in tandem. So I'm going to pose a question and Katja is going to respond and I'll supplement some of the answers so that we can have a, a good tennis game type exchange. So looking at the past first, as you know, 25th of May is the birthday anniversary of GDPR and um, it will be three years of um, the new world, the new rules um, that um, we now have. With that in mind, I wanted to ask you, Katja, what do you think of um, the three years of GDPR activities and what are, from your perspective, uh, the, the, the key trends that we um, should be discussing about? Thank you, Gabriel. Well, it's certainly been an exciting three years period. There is a lot of new case law from the European Court of Justice, and we've seen a lot of new guidelines from EDPP. Uh, I think for me, one of the key points to, to look back at is really where we are with enforcement. Um, one of the primary goals with GDPR was really to harmonize data protection laws and also to harmonize uh, enforcement across uh, the EU member states. So uh, looking back, I think that's quite crucial where we are with that. Um, and, and interestingly, the past year, we've actually seen a high increase in the number of fines across all member states. Actually, more than half of the total number of fines post-GDPR have been imposed for the past year. And that also goes for, for the value of the fines. So that's really a trend we've seen. So from a very slow beginning, we're really seeing that the local data protection agencies are, are now beginning to enforce GDPR uh, in, a, in a different mm. manner. But interestingly, there are substantial differences. We are not fully harmonized yet. You have countries like Spain, Italy, Germany and France, who have issued a high number of fines at a very high le level uh, of, of, of value, uh, whereas other countries have only issued a few fines and with a, with a lot less uh, value. So we are certainly not harmonized uh, in respect of uh, enforcement. Uh, when looking at trends, so what can we take from the past three years in, in respect of enforcement? You can see that generally organizations are, are fined for a breach of four uh, um, clauses in, in GDPR, it's either failure to comply with the transparency principle, lack of legal basis, uh, uh, lack of deletion of data, or also that the organization have not implemented the adequate security measures. Those are really the main courses for, uh, for imposing fines across all EU member states. Another trend which I think is quite interesting because the final level in GDPR is, is quite high, but you can actually see the local data protection agencies are reluctant to impose the, the highest fines possible. Uh, we can, of course, only guess uh, why uh, this is the case. Uh, maybe it's because uh, the authorities are still testing their powers. Maybe it's because uh, of the risk of appeals, because we do see a, as a trend here, more and more organizations are appealing. And they're actually being successful in, in appealing. So in cases, uh, the fines have been totally cancelled or many fines have simply been reduced quite uh, substantially. You have, as an, as an example, Marriott. They were fined almost 100 million euro. That fine was reduced to uh, 14 million euro. So this is also a trend where the organizations are appealing and they're being successful in appealing. Mm. And it's interesting what you said about uh, certain of those countries like France, Germany, Spain, who are very active on fining, but you've, you've said at the same time, other are maybe a bit behind. Obviously, the, the big elephant in the room here is Ireland. So what do you think about the, the positioning of Ireland at this moment? I guess there, there is a reason that Ireland is called the Bermuda Triangle of GDPR, because they are, in fact, receiving a lot of complaints, uh, the ISDPA, but they are only... Uh, handling 1% that, that, that leads to a, a, a decision. So, so, I mean, there are the criticism of the RSTPA at the moment not being very effective. 
And we're also hearing rumors that they lack resources. And that is, of course, and particularly for Ireland, uh, is a problem because we have the one-stop shop uh, mechanism, uh, which means that it is the authority of the main establishment of the controller processor that is a lead supervisory authority. And that is special for Ireland because all of the tech giants, they have their main establishment in Ireland. So there is a lot of criticism towards the RSDPA that they're not taking this seriously enough and not being effective enough. Actually, just less than 1% of the complaints to the RSDPA results in a decision uh, at this moment. And I guess it's also why we're seeing that other local DPAs are now trying to argue that actually we're not, if, if they receive a complaint, it's not subject to the one-stop shop mechanism because they would rather handle the complaint themselves. A good example is Kneel in the Google case. Uh, you also have ICO in UK. They have taken the same stance because they're not fully satisfied with the effectiveness of, of, of the enforcement actions of the ISTPA. Mm. Thank you. And, and for those listening to this uh, a podcast and who, who may disagree with this view, as well because they are Irish or, or have an Irish interest, do, do let us know. Drop us a line. We'll, hear, we'll love to hear from you. I think on the topic of the trends uh, for those past three years of activity, the, the one point I will add from, from my perspective is a point very much linked to the pandemic and uh, the, the COVID-related um, crisis. Because um, I think it is fair to say that in Europe, GDPR has um, slowed down medical research and innovation um, in, in many respects. Um, if you take, for instance, the example of the contract tracing apps or the capacity for employers uh, and, and, and others to track who may have had COVID or may have had a vaccine so that we can protect um, the, the, the staff or, or the public at large, uh, the fragmentation that we currently see um, in the GDPR on the context, in the context of special category data and health-related data uh, really, I think, uh, proved itself uh, by this difficulty during that uh, crisis uh, for organization, for labs, for medical institution to um, uh, really be in a position to protect people and uh, help and foster innovation. So there is probably here, uh, looking at GDPR and the current three years of, of operation, um, a takeaway around the lack of harmonization when it comes to medical research, processing of special category and health data, and, and probably a takeaway um, to transform into an action um, looking forward as, as to how we could possibly reshape that portion of the GDPR to bring more harmonization, to simplify the regime, to prevent a national fragmentation so that we can ultimately um, improve uh, innovation, foster uh, medical research uh, opportunities, and obviously protect um, all population at the same time. So certainly a point here that um, we may want to keep an eye on. Okay, well, that's about the past, but enough about the past. Look at the future because we, we want to be optimistic. We want to be forward looking. So, you know, GDPR is not going to go away. It's probably here to stay. So what are, from your perspective, Katja, the, the things in the radar, the, the key uh, elements we, we should be aware of um, for the months and years to come? Well, I think it would be hard to, uh, to look forward without mentioning data transfers. It is the hot topic uh, within privacy and has been for the past year and will be for months and probably years to come due to the, uh, the Scrims 2 ruling last year that invalidated the privacy shield scheme and also uh, means that if you use standard contractual clauses going forward, you have to do uh, substantial work to actually assess the, the country that you're transferring data into and decide whether or not you need supplementary measures. So there has been a great deal of uncertainty uh, amongst organizations within uh, the EU and actually also outside the EU about the extent of, of this ruling. And we are seeing that the regulators also are having problems solving this. 
the guidelines that, EP, that EDPP uh, issued or sent out in hearing last year, well, they still haven't been finalized. There were so many hearing responses because this is, of course, crucial for so many organizations within the EU that they can transfer data lawfully outside of, of the EU. Uh, so, so while we are still waiting for, for guidelines on this, uh, we can see that uh, companies, organizations across uh, Europe, they are trying their best to perform a risk assessment or, or to reach out to data processors. But I can see that in particularly in contract negotiations the past year and, and, and until we, we, we are fully aligned with what EDPP wants uh, in respect of supplementary measures, it's, it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to, to negotiate data transfers right now and will be in the years to come because we simply are not... We don't know what to regulate. We're still waiting for guidance uh, on this. Um, so, uh, and once we have the guidance, well, then organization will have to implement it if it is if it is possible. Because the guidance we've seen so far, well, it presumes that you can you you can encrypt the data or somehow makes the data on unaccessible to the recipient in the third country. But there are a lot of data transfers where you need access. You need to see the data in, in clear text. And we don't really have any solutions to that. So um, so that would be interesting to see going forward and also in the final EPP guidelines if there are offered any solutions to this. We are also waiting for the commission's uh, final standard contractual clauses, which will, of course, also mean a lot of work for organizations around uh, Europe. Uh, because you have, at least in the draft, uh, one year to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to use the new uh, standard contractual clauses. So there will be a lot of work just entering into new model clauses with all your data importers. So for sure, third country transfers will remain a, a hot topic mm. uh, going yeah. forward. No, I, I agree with that. And, and certainly, although it will be a bit of a burdensome and administrative paperwork exercise for many of our uh, listener of the podcast it is unfortunately what is going to be expected from from organization um, going forward i know you have a second thought but because it's um related to e-privacy i just wanted to interject and, and insert one in the context of uh, gdpr the one i i thought of was around people um, and and the importance of having privacy specialists having data protection officers uh, on board so that your companies, uh, your organization can do the right thing. I think here there is a big HR point that we, we, can, we, we can share with you looking forward, um, which is around um, the fact that those people are in demand. Um, a lot of organization at this moment want to in-house privacy expertise, wants to be able to have dedicated uh, individuals looking after the, the topic, but at the same time, the market doesn't have enough supply, does not have enough talents to respond to the demand. So if you are in um, research for talent in that privacy space, you're certainly not the only one. You're certainly competing with others. And, and therefore, our, our message will be, well, if you have people, look after them because they may run away. And if you don't have people and you want um, uh, people, uh, just be ready um, to, to have to, to compete with others because that is... Uh, a sort of a premium uh, resources at the moment, um, and even law firms, including us, um, are uh, feeling uh, that difficulty when it comes to, to recruitment. So uh, a point about people uh, uh, that you, you may want to take away. So that's the HR side, but um, we also sort of about e-privacy, Katja, right? Yeah, a lot of interesting things are going on right now. Just in general, I think cookies will well it is already a hot topic and it will continue to be a hot topic we've had for the past year two years had a lot of clarification both from local data protection agencies and also EPP. we can see now that local data protection agencies are starting to enforce the cookie rules and that are performing investigations of websites uh, to to ensure compliance with the cookie rules on top of that as we mentioned we have the e-privacy regulation it's been four years undergoing now maybe we are at the end of the line now well, there is at least a draft now proposed uh, by the EU Council, and the draft will now go into trilog negotiations, and hopefully, uh, we'll manage to uh, to uh, to finalize it uh, this time around. <clears throat> As with GDPR, the e-privacy regulation 
will replace a current directive to make sure that the rules are harmonized uh, and also because the current directive is outdated. Um, the fines, uh, I think quite interesting, is the same in, in the draft regulation as in GDPR. So uh, for sure, we'll see, at the, I think, a new wave <laughs> once, hopefully this time around, we'll have uh, the regulation because uh, non-compliance will, will certainly hurt uh, when you apply the GDPR fines uh, also to, to e-privacy regulation. Mm. Um, as with GDPR, there will be a two-year grace period. So let's just say that they will finalize the regulation this year. There will be a two-year grace period before you actually have to comply with the, uh, the regulation so, so that all the European companies, organizations will have time to, to adjust. So that would be very interesting to follow uh, this negotiation and finger crossed that I think the four is this the 14 drafts so or 14 times? Oh, maybe I that's don't know. The, I've stopped counting for sure because uh, there've been so many. <laughs> so fingers crossed, as as exactly. you have you as you said and and showed on the image. I I, I think it's clearly um, an highly anticipated text which will possibly trigger a lot of uh, rethinking um, when we see a final product. So the question is, when are we going to see this final product? Hopefully soon. But clearly, based on what you said and the the the, the fact that there will be a two years possible um, uh, delay before entry into force of the, the the rules, it's a sort of a medium term horizon item. So you know, look for something in twenty twenty three possibly um, is is a key mm. key message. Well, with that and, and possibly to to wrap up, um, while we are on the topic of reform uh, and reform, meaning the the GDPR and the privacy. Uh, well, certainly on the GDPR, um, there is, I think, also um, a, a valid question uh, being posed to us as to whether or not um, it, it should be also something that Brussels may want to be to be thinking about. Um, you may have heard from uh, my um, sort of so-so uh, a point about the medical research um, and, and the slowdown of um, innovation opportunities that GDPR can sometimes um, uh, uh, permit or create, uh, that I'm a bit in favor of that. But I, I think others in that space uh, feel the same. It was interesting, for instance, to note that um, Axel Foss, one of the very prominent member of the European Parliament behind uh, the GDPR uh, drafting, um, is, uh, for instance, one of those uh, Brussels um, stakeholders who uh, went on record um, and, and clearly um, expressed a view that indeed it was probably a time for Brussels to think about um, some adjustments. We, we're not talking and we're not calling for a complete redraft. I think that that will be too ambitious, that will be wrong, that will be also too costly. But but certainly some adjustments in certain of the chapters on things like um, medical research or possibly uh, data transfers. Why not? Uh, could be could be welcome and and may give some ideas to our um, lawmakers um, when um, the time has come. So uh, probably also something that um, we may want to to encourage. We may want to to keep an eye on to to see if ultimately it materialises. Right. We are at the end of this podcast. I should have brought a birthday cake because I'm conscious that we are celebrating the three years of anniversary of the GDPR. But no cake for me, no cake for you, Katia, today. But I'm sure there will be other opportunities. We hope you enjoy this podcast with us. Um, if you are on LinkedIn, we have an official Bird and Bird privacy page, which we all encourage you to follow. Otherwise, more than welcome to connect and exchange ideas with you guys over the phone, over email, or any other social media platforms and channels you have. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Let's stay in touch. Thanks for having me on this podcast. Thank you.